A very warm welcome to you all. It's so lovely to see your faces here today. My name is Remy Carrero and I work in the Performers Programs Department here at the sag After Foundation. We've got a super amazing program lined up for you today, but before we dive in, I just want to take a quick moment to remind everyone about our COVID-19 relief fund. We are still raising funds for this relief project as we know the need from our membership is very great. Gifts are 100% tax deductible, and this is the only fund which gives 100% to sag After members to this very community here on this chat. Since March 16, we're 16th, we're proud to say that we've given $2.7 million to over 2,600 members. But the need for support continues to grow as we all move through this unprecedented time together. If you can help, please give, and if you need help, please ask. Now, I am thrilled to introduce our guest today, Nikki Levy. Nikki is the head of scripted content at DreamWorks TV at NBC Universal. She's got an incredible resume and she is the creator of the live event and podcast, Don't Tell My Mother, where celebrities tell true stories that they would never want their moms to know. It's an absolutely incredible show. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand the reins over to Nikki. Nikki, if you'd like to take it away. Hi guys. Well, it's really nice to meet everyone. I'm sorry I can't see everybody um but i really appreciate you guys coming out and just want to thank sag you guys have an awesome union and um i'm grateful they asked me to be here and thanks to remy and danny um so anyway i just want to thank you for being here and um uh you know honestly i feel like any way to give structure to a day is a good thing <laughs> so um i am also really happy to be here um, I'm going to start off with uh, a poem that I love. I'm actually not a poem person, but uh, I do think this is a terrific poem, and I think it says a lot and kind of speaks directly to what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, and I, you know, I think this, this poet is super influential, um, and it's worth sharing what she wrote. Uh, I ask you to close your eyes and just kind of get, get grounded. Let's, you know, just get in the room. Uh, I know most people are, you know, there's, they're, they're just like, we're, we're just off in some way. So I guess for me, any, any opportunity to kind of get grounded is a good one. So just close your eyes and I'm going to read this to you guys. If I'm shining, everybody going to shine. I was born like this. Don't even got to try. I'm like Chardonnay, get better over time. Heard you say I'm not the baddest bitch. You lied. It ain't my fault that I'm out here making news. I'm the pudding in the proof. Got to blame it on my juice. Got to blame it on my juice, baby. Anyone know this poet? By a show of hands. Yes, this is, this is the great Lizzo. Uh, I love Lizzo. If you don't know Lizzo, Google Lizzo immediately. She is the most incredible performer, I think, on earth at this moment. And she's asking this really important question. And the question is, what is your juice? When I ask what is your juice, I mean, what makes you unique? What makes you different? What are the things that if you guys were going in for an audition or a general meeting or a first date or you're meeting your significant other's family, what is the thing about you or the many things about you that you would not want to share? Because I'm here to tell you and, uh, and evangelize to you that the things that you guys hide, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm saying this from learning this on my, you know, learning this for myself. I'm not sharing anything with you that I don't practice and believe 100%. The things that we don't want to talk about, the things we're embarrassed about, the things in our childhood that um, made us feel really stupid, I will use that word because, you know, it's sometimes the way we talk to ourselves or dumb or embarrassing I promise you and I guarantee you guys, if we bring those things into the air and we start to own those stories, those are going to be your greatest superpowers for your careers. A hundred thousand percent. I will speak from experience. I come from, um, I come from a hoarder household. So I grew up in Queens and in New York. And, uh, you know, we lived in this, you know, lovely little residential neighborhood and we were the house with the cars on the front lawn. Anyone relate to this? Fortune Feemster, if you guys know Fortune, she and I 
commiserate mm-hmm. over this because she she also comes from a hoarder household. Um, and the idea that, um, you know, for so long um, growing up for that reason and many reasons, I felt like an outcast. You know, I mean, I couldn't have friends over. If I did, my mom and I would grab the big black garbage bags. We throw all the shit in there. We put it down into the basement, you know, metaphorically and, you know, and not metaphorically. Right. And it would be, let's just hide it and we'll pretend like we're normal. Like, you know, don't look at the burned out cars on the lawn. Everything's great here. It's all good. I'm normal. See, I'm, I'm normal. I promise you I'm normal. Don't open that door to the basement. And Partially, I think why I love storytelling, and I'm guessing you guys all actually have sort of a, uh, a similar story in one way or another, is because forever, I have felt like an outsider. And honestly, until I learned that I need to embrace it, I hid that I felt like an outsider and probably tried to, um, tried to make up for it in ways that were completely transparent and people could see absolutely through and they think, you know, you know what are you putting on this, this thing for? But it's because I always felt weird and I always felt different and I always thought I needed to hide it to fit in, to get what I want, right? And we're either like, you know, we're either, um, you know, we're, we're wanting something different or we're wanting something better and we're not feeling worthy. And I think that is a very sort of like normal and common theme amongst actors, performers, writers. Um, I have to ask you guys a quick question, which, and if you could just ch- chat it to me, who here um, identifies primarily as an actor? It might seem like a silly thing, but I, it, a lot of people are multi-hyphenates. Okay, and who, I see a lot of yeses and a lot of Lizzo's. I'm all for Lizzo and yes. Um, and out of curiosity, thank you, and out of curiosity, who also, and if you said yes before, that's fine, who also um, identifies as a writer, like on top of being an actor or a performer, you also identify as a writer. A lot of people. Okay. Great. Great. Good. This is, this is me and just working on writing now. I will share one thing with you and then I, I'm going to move on, but I, I will just say um, for everyone who said, yes, they're also a writer. Um, that's, that's a great answer, honestly, because in this day and age, um, and especially with TV the way it is, we, we should all be writing as well as performing. Because really, right, it's very helpful to write, to write stuff for ourselves. But I want to I want to ask, I want to almost implore you that during this time, if there is any downtime, I know a lot of people don't have downtime right now, but if there is any downtime, um, the only thing that makes you a writer or not a writer is to pick up the damn pen and write. Yes, Kimberly's like, yes, that is it. I remember, I just want to tell you guys this. About four years ago, I was living in this little apartment in West Hollywood. It was so great. I was paying $1,400 a month. I was very single. It was just me and my rescue pit bull. And I had nowhere to go. It was for, I think it was like Passover, Jewish. And I got invited to this Passover of a friend of a friend. Like, I was like, where the hell do I go for this holiday? I wasn't dating anybody. I was just my, I don't know, you know, my, my family's all back east. And I got invited and I remember thinking like, what do I want to make? And I was like, God, I want to make a pecan pie. And I remember sitting on my cheap little piece of shit Ikea chair and thinking, I want to make a pecan pie. And the first thought that came to my mind was, no, you can't make a pecan pie. You've never baked anything in my life. I've never baked anything. I I love to cook. I don't, I don't, I didn't know how to bake. And I was like, I I can't do that. I'm going to just buy, I'm going to buy the pecan pie. And then I remember sitting, it was like dark and I'm sitting on this chair in my room. And I remember thinking out of nowhere, okay, wait, you, you've told the story that you're not a baker, so you absolutely cannot do a pecan pie. But if you literally just bought the crust, followed a recipe on Google and made it, even if it tastes like crap, you can no longer say you're not a baker. You, you then get to say you're a baker because you, you baked. Like enough with the stories, enough with the stories of, oh, I don't do this, so I can't do this. So I will say that to you. I also love pecan pie and relish any opportunity to think about it. But, um, but, you know, but, but I, I will say, pick up a pen tonight, get your notebook out, get the back of a bill that, you know, that, you know, that's sitting on the kitchen table, you know, it's recently out of quarantine, turn it over and just write something. And the next time someone says, oh, are you also a writer? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Because the truth is, and I, I say this to everybody you know, um, if you survive childhood, you have enough stories to last for the rest of your life. And we're all, we're all adults on this, 
we're all adults on this channel. So yes, I mean, we may feel like we're 12 sometimes, but we are all, you know, we, we, we are all adults and you, you are writers, you are performers, you are writers, and it is our job as artists. And I don't mean the word artist in a way that's sometimes I bristle, to be honest, when people say that word. And I will say my background, I, I am a writer performer also. So I, I say this like personally, sometimes artist feels a little highfalutin and a little like unnecessarily highbrow, honestly. But I'm going to use the word for this purpose, which is if you uh, are an artist, it is, and you, us, it is our job as artists. We are alchemists, right? That is what literally that is, that is, why we have these gifts to write, to act, to, to make music, to, to bake a pie, whatever it is. We are artists and we are alchemists. And as alchemists, it is our job, truly, truly, it is our job to turn shit into gold. That is, the, that is what an artist does. That is what a, an actor does. That is what a writer does. And that is what's different between us, 110 people on this call, and the rest of the real world, you know, who maybe wants to sublimate their feelings or doesn't have the, you know, doesn't have that, um, that, that gift or that calling, that passion to, to act, to write, to perform, all of that stuff. We turn shit into gold. We take shit, we dust it off, we dry it in the sun. I don't know. We get the things from the 99 cent store. I love the 99 cent store. We make, and all of a sudden, I did not know that was shit. I thought that was this beautiful, I'm making this up cupcake. Well, for camera, it's a cupcake. In real life, that is my dog's shit from the night before. You get what I'm saying? We are, that, so this is what we do. So I would like you guys just to please, yes, I 100% do recommend The Alchemist. So let me just share a tiny, tiny bit about my background, and then we're going to go into um, the point of this class, which is, um, you know, your, your story is your superpower and coming up with sort of a log line of you. So just to give you guys a tiny thing, and by the way, uh, Danny, you can pull the slide back. Just to give you guys a tiny bit about me, um, I'm from New York, I'm from Queens, I went to Northwestern for, for college and I went for, for writing, um, writing, and, writing and performing, but I focused more on writing. Um, and then I was over at Oxygen in New York um, back in the day when Jerry Layborn and Oprah launched it. I was there 90, 1999 before I think I was like the 37th employee. And I worked inside Chelsea Market and I was in television then. And then when I moved out to Los Angeles, I started at um, Endeavor, which is like a talent agency. Of course, you guys know this. It's now WME. I went over to a production company called Denovi Pictures. We made a bunch of movies there. Um, our deal was at Warner's, so we were, we were, it was super prolific. Um, and I met my mentor there, which I am internally grateful for her even 17 years later. She's still my mentor. Um, she has the show for life on, uh, I think it's ABC. That, you know that show for life? Yeah. She's so prolific. It's amazing. Um, and then I went over to Gold Circle Films, which is a buyer. So, you know, we made movies for Universal and we financed them. Um, shortly after I went over to Imagine, which was, you know, Ron Howard's company. I did a bunch of stuff there, mostly comedy is my background is comedy, but I did make the movie Frost Nixon, which was fun, funny, but I would not probably call it a comedy. Um, <laughs> but I mean, definitely funny moments. Um, and then, uh, I got sick of everything and, um, traveled around and lived in Buddhist monasteries for six weeks, uh, because I needed a break and I was burnt out. I was super burnt out. And I thought for sure I will move back to New York. That is what I'm going to do. I'm going to get maybe one job here in LA and it's going to lead me back to New York. And I worked at Fox uh, and I uh, did not end up moving back to New York, but I ended up starting this show here called Don't Tell My Mother where kind of celebrities and, and really great up and coming performers tell true stories they wouldn't want their moms to know. And I thought, and that's where I got to do what I love, which is working with actors. And I put that sort of over here. Because what that, what that whole show and that process is, is working with people who don't write, don't call themselves writers, like whether it's Tracy Ellis Ross at the time or like Terry Hatcher or Kate McKinnon, whatever. They didn't consider themselves writers and realizing, and me realizing, to be very honest, and I'm telling you guys this, you guys as actors, you guys who are primarily actors or came up through performance, you are the best storytellers there, there are. You, you guys 
you guys have the gift in a way, and I will tell you this, that writers do not. Because a writer can tell a story about rescuing kids from a burning building, and you'll be like, uh-huh, and you'll like wanna, you know, tweet, you could wanna tweeze out your arm hair, and then you get an actor up there that tells the story of going to CVS and trying to get, you know, the last roll of toilet paper, and it's about toilet paper, and I am glued to the screen or glued to the stage to listen to you because you know how to deliver a story. So what we're gonna talk about, do you guys know what I'm saying when I say that? That is why writers, and there's no, no shade on writers, but, it, but this is why writers are thriving during quarantine and why they really prefer to be in a room alone with their cat. I say this as my wife is alone in a room with the cat. She is, she has, she's in the, it's in the cat room. We call it the cat -ic. So, right, but that's the thing. Actors thrive, and I'm not saying a lot of actors aren't introverts, because we are, often, not always. Um, but, but there is really, really, really something special about the gift and the presence of an actor to tell a story. So I want you guys just to know that you have that. So even if you've never put a pen to paper, you know how to tell a story, and you know how to deliver a story. Yes? You're with me? Okay. Great. It's hard for me to um, uh, keep, keep up with all the chats, so I'll look over occasionally, okay? But just know I'm not ignoring anyone. I'm just trying to focus on, um, you know, you guys. So I always thought that, you know, uh, that what I did with Don't Tell My Mother was very separate because it was people's real stories, right? It was personal stories. And the idea was taking these, these painful stories, uh, awkward stories, difficult stories, and making them funny and crafting them. But I always thought that was very different from my, my real career, which is I'm over, I've been over at DreamWorks TV for a long time doing, your, doing scripted content for them, mostly comedy. And I always thought that was very different because one is, you know, sort of, you know, narrative and, and fiction and one is real life. And I quickly, quickly realized, or maybe not quickly enough, that there is something very important and very powerful about bringing our personal story, our personal story, Okay, what, what's real for us into our work life. There is an absolute Venn diagram of success when we bring who we really are and what our real backstory is into a role we're auditioning for, a general meeting we're having, um, a character we're writing for ourselves in a TV show, a movie, a, a web series. I don't give a shit. And I'm sorry I curse, but I'm not sorry really. So that, so there is something very important about not keeping them separate. And I will tell you from experience, my entire time being executive, executive for like 20 years, I have been told like I'm too loud. I'm too, I imagine told me I was too loud. I'm too much. Uh, simmer down, simmer down. I mean, what even is that? And I always thought, you know, I'm, I'm in my forties now. I know I look great. Just kidding. But, um, but I was in my forties and I'm like, you know, like all of my 30s, I was like, or and 20s, I was just like, how do I do this? Like, how do I be less? It's almost like it just was anathema to me. And I have a, 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 another mentor. Do you guys know the brilliant Broadway actress and ever, performer, just brilliant teacher, Alexandra Billings? She's from tr Untransparent, but really, you know, she's Steppenwolf. And yes, we know her. Alexandra Brillings is this phenomenal actor, performer, singer, cabaret. She's a trans woman from Chicago, lives in LA. And I took a Steppenwolf class from her uh, and she's also done Don't Tell My Mother. And she said something that I will never forget and I want to impart to you. And I, and I, I ask you to, to put your hand on your heart when I say this so you can pull it in a little bit, which is we're told less is more and everyone says less is more. Less is not more. Less is never more. Less is less. And that's like math. And I'm not even good at math, but I can tell you that less is seriously just less. So I'm asking, at least in this hour that we have together, that you guys bring your whole self here and that all the things we don't like about ourselves, of which I know there are many for me too. I mean, many, many, many things, you know, and I think in quarantine, they're starting to become so apparent, you know, like my impatience isn't apparent, is apparent. My, I mean, you know, we, we're, we're spending all this time with ourselves. But less is not more, less is less. And it is time that we start bringing more of ourselves, truly more of who we are, the little things about ourselves that we don't like, the things that we think are strange or weird, 
this is the time, this is the time, and I don't just mean in our class, I mean in general, this is the time when we bring ourselves, our full selves. And people that don't like it, they're not going to want to work with us anyway. So even if we pretend we're somewhere else and we get on the set, it's going to be a rude awakening for everybody. So we might as well just come with our full selves right from the get. Okay. So as a bit of background, um, we're in a very cool time right now in our business. Um, I'm sure you guys can, can relate to this, and I hope you're seeing it in breakdowns and in uh, you know, auditions and whatnot, but you know, back in the 80s and 90s um, and in the early, and in the aughts also, um, you guys could probably discern that TV for the most part looked the same. Is that, we, we can sort of agree that you know, there was a, a very, um, I don't know, there was a, like a homogeneity, I think, to, to most shows, certainly not all. Um, you know, and, and I think part of that is, you know, uh, I, I think they're mostly white, a lot of the shows, um, and hence a lot of the roles. I think the, the kind of like, if we're talking about class, there was sort of like a middle class, you know, everybody loves Raymond, you could say middle class, and there's sort of like, the, you know, the well-to-do, the, the, the Frasers, you know, um, definitely straight. Um, and I think there was a feeling that, or at least I had the feeling, that any character from one show could be kind of lifted into another. Like, almost like Seinfeld could have made an appearance in Everybody Loves Raymond as Ray's long lost Jewish cousin, Jerry from Frank's side. Like, that's a pl that could have been a plausible crossover episode. And, you know, people probably would have like jumped for joy and loved it. Um, but there's a reason why that was the case. And that the reason was, um, and I've worked with a lot of these people and they're wonderful, but you know, it really was the same guy and I use sort of a generality, but really like the same guy, you know, they would, they would usually graduate from the Harvard Lampoon, they tended to be white Jewish guys. Um, and they were, I mean, it's Curb, it's Seinfeld, it's Frasier, it's Friends. I mean, we could go on and on and on. And so there isn't, you know, a surprise here that television um, and I'm really going to speak to TV, that TV really, you know, really looked fairly similar. And that's because of the old adage, you know, we write what we know, we perform what we know, all of that. And I think there was a real disservice to TV um, and certainly a disservice to fantastic actors and fantastic writers um, because, you know, you kind of had to be well, in the ballpark of this one kind of person to be able to, you know, get who Jerry Seinfeld was, to be able to get who Ray Romano, Romano was, you know, to be able to get who the Friends people are, right? They're, they're New Yorkers, so we're, we're sort of talking about a, a, the same ilk of people. And then we have the advent of cable and then the streamers. And because of that, so many more stories can be told. And so many different stories. And the cool thing is what that translates into is so many different roles. Yeah, we, we've, all sort of, we've all sort of seen that, right? We, have, we, can, we can talk about, and I, I'll, it's worth mentioning a few shows right now, just as an example. So who here likes Fleabag? You could just raise your hand. I see about five people, but okay, cool. So, you know, so we have Fleabag, right? So what's Fleabag about? Well, Fleabag, um, you know, I could say it's about a sexually free, uh, kind of at times miserable, despicable lady in London, you know, who talks to her dead friend. I'm simplifying it. We could talk about Insecure, fabulous show. Insecure, we could say, okay, well, it follows the kind of awkward experiences and, you know, daily tribulations of a single black woman in LA, you know, Issa Rae. We could talk about sex education, which, um, by the way, if you're not watching these shows, I highly recommend you watch these shows. Um, sex education is like one of my, one of my favorites. Um, so sex education, we can say it's a British comedy um, about an awkward teenage virgin who becomes a self-proclaimed sex therapist. And then lastly, we could talk about unorthodox. Unorthodox, um, Let's say it's a four episode story of an Orthodox Jewish girl who escapes Williamsburg by moving to Berlin. Um, and the show is in Yiddish. It's in Yiddish. I mean, that's crazy. That's unheard of. Uh, so 
given these, these, these four or five examples, what an interesting, what an interesting like cadre of shows and what an interesting group of actors that are playing in them and writers that are writing them. And what I say about this is because this is unprecedented. What I mean when I say that is these stories, these, these four or five that I mentioned, and, and we could talk about a million other stories and people have written down on the side uh, other way, other, you know, many, many other shows. We could talk Broad City, you could talk Vita. I mean, you could talk, I love, um, uh, what's that show? I'm loving it right now. It's with uh, Succession. I love Succession too. Um, but, the, but this really cool thing is because the genres are changing and the, the specific stories are changing and the, the kinds of characters we're talking about, because these are so interesting and different, what's needed in terms of the cast and what's needed in terms of the writers is what, hey guys, what don't we have in this, in this thing? Oh, I need, I need that lead character. She is, I need someone who speaks Yiddish. I need someone who is this age group. I need someone who understands Orthodox Judaism. Okay, um, uh, for sex education, I need, you know, we're looking for the best friend character. Yeah, we're thinking he's, the main character's a white guy, he's a straight guy. I'm thinking we need an actor of color, someone, someone who's gonna be very different, but a great compliment to Otis, our main character. And so we're, we're like letting all this wonderful light in and all these wonderful actors and performers and writers with their different stories that have been pushed to the sidelines and not been able to shine, this is the time. And often what I do when I'm hiring writers, when I'm hiring actors and I, you know, I, I'm hiring actors for me or casting is awesome because it means, I'm, it means my show's going, you know, so that's like the most fun. Um, but I am constantly looking for what don't I have in this cast and what don't I have in this room? And the only way I'm going to know that in a, in a real meaningful way is if you guys tell me, and I'm going to share a little about what that looks like. Um, do me a favor, Danny, can you throw the last card in please? Cool. So, um, just write on the side if you don't know. Does anyone not know what a log line is? There's no shame in this, like, at all. Um, cool. Um, cool. So a log line is, uh, and by the way, Stephen, um, yes, there is definitely English, and there's also, you know, there's also Yiddish, so we do both. Um, cool. So um, let me share with you guys what a log line is, if you don't know. So for those of us who doesn't know, a log line is kind of, a brief, um, usually one sentence summary of um, a project. It could be your web series, your movie, uh, a book. Um, it could be an article you're writing. It can be uh, a character you created, a character that's, um, you know, a character that you're writing for yourself, a TV show, whatever it is. And it's usually a one sentence summary of that project that kind of states the central conflict of the story and it often provides kind of both a synopsis of the plot, but also like an emotional hook to stimulate interest. Does that make sense for you guys? Cool. Um, you can lose the slide now. So we're used to talking about log lines, not as it ever pertains to us, but as it pertains to like, oh, hey, um, I'm in this web series. I'm making this up. I'm in this web series uh, and it's about... Um, it's about a, uh, African-American guy who grew up in mid city and creates, um, the first, uh, CSA far farm program, um, in South central. That's a real joke. So that's a, that's an example of a log line. And another example of a log line are all the, all the log lines I gave you guys about unorthodox sex education. Um, uh, what other shows did I mention? insecure. And what I want to share with you guys is something that is going to be very helpful for you is not just if you know how to describe your project really, really well, but and, and a give a compelling log line. So you're, you know, you're at a party or you're in a meeting and you're, you're giving a very compelling log line about this 
project you're in. Uh, a pilot you shot, um, a short you shot, whatever it is. That's wonderful. But what's going to be incredibly helpful and, the, and that what, what I hope we get to, to really get into today is the idea that before people buy from you, right? Before they, bu they buy from you. And when I say that, I mean um, uh, before they cast you, before they hire you, before they uh, have you come on as a writer. So before they buy from you, they buy into you. So before people buy from you, they will buy into you. And when I, when I say that, what I mean is, you know, when we work on a project, when we're working on a show, when we're working on a movie, when we're developing a movie or a show, we spend so much time, I spend so much time with the creatives involved that you, you, you guys are either going to really love each other or you're not going to love each other at all. And it's something that we all feel, whether it's a director, a, you know, a showrunner, a casting director, is um, we want to work with people that we connect with. And we want to work with people that we like. And we want to work with people, by the way, who, who we really know have a vested interest in the project and are uniquely suited to this particular project, meaning their presence is an ingredient that is so additive. And it doesn't just come from being a wonderful performer. That's, that's great. And I'm, I'm assuming you guys are all, you know, in the guild and you guys are taking time out of your busy Thursdays to, you know, to attend a class. I'm assuming you guys are all really committed and I'm assuming you guys are all talented. I'm going to take that as sort of a given. So beyond that, why are you, and I'm looking at one person, I don't even know who I'm looking at. I'm looking at you in the white shirt. I don't know your name. Sorry. Um, Melba, Melba's coming up and I'm not asking a question yet, Melba, but, but why are you uniquely suited to this role? So why do we hire Melba? Sorry, Melba, I'm putting you on the spot, but it's why, you know, why if Melba's, you know, brilliant for the role, why if, um, uh, Tamara, why if, you know, Elena, why if Jill, whatever, why if, I have, you know, four different wonderful choices I've narrowed down to um, who could be terrific for this role. Why, why am I going to hire Melba? Why am I going to hire whoever? And what I want to talk about today is learning how to position ourselves, our backstory, our personal story, and how to position that to whatever it is. It's a casting director. It's an executive you guys are meeting with. It's um, uh, a regular, you know, a, a director, director. It's a showrunner, wh whatever it is. How are you guys stating what you love, what you're good at, what you want to do, and then backing it up with why you are the right person to do it? So in other words, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, how are we going to craft the log line of ourselves? In a, I will just also say, like, if you guys want, um, I'll email, uh, I can email Remy what the examples of the log lines that I gave for those four or five shows, just, just to get a sense. But it's about how do I bring myself, my unique talents, how do I craft that into a story to sort of state my case? Okay, cool. Okay, so I will share, uh, I will share kind of a little bit of a, a little off the cuff log line for myself because I've been playing around with my own log line actually. So, you know, um, I'm a Jewish New Yorker who comes from a crazy divorced family where there was yelling all the time and the only escape was climbing into my bookshelf and hiding between the top of the bookshelf and the ceiling and watching Coming to America on repeat in the living room. So it was hiding in the bookshelf or Eddie Murphy. Those are my escapes. And I will tell you, the amount of times I've watched Coming to America, I know that movie as well as I know the ceiling of my childhood bedroom. So needless to say, I love 
dysfunctional family comedies. I love them. I love them. It's what I watch. It's what I write. Um, it's, it's the stories I'm most interested in. Uh, you know, uh, a big, a, a TV show like Big Little Lies, I will never be the person that writes on that show. I will never want to write on that show. I don't know from the rich white people. I don't come from that at all. I, I, sex education I get. I get, I, I feel like those kids, you know, I feel like those outcasts, you know. Um, uh, what, what else do I, Fleabag, uh, I, I, I get that more. The show Modern Family or Parenthood, I, I feel that, you know. Um, Real Women Have Curves, back in the day, that movie. Love that movie, love that movie. Um, Parenthood, the movie, hell yeah, love that, love that so much. Um, but that's my upbringing and that's my story. And that's why I love dysfunction and I love stories that are raw and vulnerable and you're just laughing at your own awkwardness and ridiculousness. Because I spend so much time hiding it that I'm sick of it. And as I said before to you guys, I imagine, you know, you guys might not have grown up with a hoarder household or, you know, or, or having a divorced parent or whatever. But I know, I know, because you wouldn't be in this call if it wasn't true. I know you guys have that one or two, those one or two things growing up that made you feel, and, and, and by the way, as an adult too, that made you feel weird or different. Whatever, whatever it was. You're a latchkey kid and you, you know, you're like, oh yeah, my mom's just in. And then you'd like get the key from under the mat. I mean, I don't know what, what your story was, but, I, but I, I guarantee you there's something that has made you feel like an outsider your whole life. Is that, is that accurate? Like, yes, okay. So um, thank you, Latasha, I get it. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, because um, I bet you that, uh, you know, if we did a longer class, if we went and we did 20 different people here and you just unmuted yourself for a moment and said the one weird thing, every, you'd get a this from everybody else if that they relate. So there's a lot to be said. And I, I, re I recommend a couple of books to you guys, by the way. One of the books um, you might have read already. Um, do you guys, uh, have you read the book Daring Greatly? I recommend that book. Um, it's Brene Brown. There's another book I recommend too. Let me, let me just pull it up for, my, for you guys. Hold on. Um, I don't know if you guys do this, but um, I love um, the library apps. And uh, they're free. And there's a couple of you guys should check out if you're members of, this is LA Public Library, so I don't know about New York, but, um, but uh, there's a couple of apps you should do for free books. One is called Overdrive. I do, I do audiobooks and regular books, um, like eBooks, but I do Overdrive. And then there's a new app for me, new, um, it's called Libby and it's free. And I'm, I listen to um, a lot of books on my free Libby app. And it's free and you can also watch movies um, and read books. So it's a great way to, uh, it's a great way to read or listen while you're doing the dishes. Um, so there's another book I want to recommend called Opening Up by Writing It Down. Um, I heard good things about it. I'm reading this now and it's by a guy named James Pennebaker and it's called Open Up, Opening Up by Writing It Down, How Expressive Writing Improves Health and Eases Emotional Pain. Um, okay, great. So needless to say, like how we were raised, you know, how we were brought up has so influenced, um, you know, not only what we do and the, the fact that we are actors, performers, writers, artists, but what we are drawn to. So I gave you a tiny, tiny sample of what mine was, right? How I grew up that certain way. Now I love dysfunctional family comedies. That's a very simple, simple example for me. So let me wrap up. I just want to say, you know, the, the, the cool thing about, about what we're doing when we're coming up with a log line for ourselves and we are bringing more to the table than just our, you know, really kick-ass audition or our kick-ass reel or our kick-ass, you know, self-tape, whatever. Um, we're, we're actually doing three things when we can kind of master. And I don't mean perfect because we're never perfecting it and it's always changing. Um, but when we can craft our own log line for these meetings, for, for generals, all of this, 
we're doing three things. So we're saying, you know, why this role, this world, this story um, is exactly my cup of tea, right? So like, I love this and here's why. What we're also doing is proving that we can tell a story. We are literally showing that we can craft a story. We are crafting our own story. And, and so we're crafting the story, right, for our, own, um, for our own benefit, but essentially we're showing them that we can be funny, we can be interesting, we can be compelling, we can craft a story, and that's what we do. As actors, that's what we do. And the third thing we're doing, which I actually think is the most important thing, is, so if you guys do read Daring Greatly right, by Brene Brown, it is about how being vulnerable it basically promises that someone will connect with you because i don't know if you've ever experienced this but if you're you know if someone is vulnerable with you, you you may not like them very much like you just still may not like them but there is a part of you that kind of loves them a little bit just because when someone's vulnerable you you can't not feel for them. You can't not connect with them. And so when we are sharing our story in a very crafted way, you know, uh, and, and in a strategic way, so we're sharing only what we want to share, we are allowing someone to connect with us. We are connecting with them. And in turn, usually when we are disclosed to someone, they often disclose to us. And that's just sort of the way it is. So we are creating a connection with somebody. And that is, that is kind of all you want to do in this business is create a genuine connection. And when you are bringing your full self to the table, and again, you're, you know, you're cutting and pasting, you're decide, deciding what you want to share, you are forcing someone, and I say that jokingly, but you're kind of making someone like you connect with you. And maybe you're not going to be right for this role you know what, but, right? We, we don't know and chances are we're not right for it, okay. But they will remember you because you shared a personal story with them. They will, I guarantee you, they will not forget you. They won't. So we're gonna use our stories, our awkwardness, our weirdness, our embarrassing shit in service to us. Not anymore of something we wanna bury and pretend isn't there and, and we were using, expending all that energy to, to push it down. We are going to bring it to light and use it and own it. Well, I'm very, very happy I got to spend this time with you. I'm actually teaching another class, so I do have to jump um, uh, and eat something and then teach. But um, I'm very glad you guys are, were here. Yes, Eric, I do do one-on-ones. Um, I'll give you, uh, Remy can give you my email. Um, and um, I hope you guys learned something. And um, and just know that, you know, the, your, your stories really are, it's your, it's, it's your ticket. It's your ticket. All right. Thank you so, so much for joining us today, Nikki. Thank you for bringing your expertise to this. And thank you all for tuning into this um, and showing your wonderful faces. Everybody, please be well and be safe. And we hope to see you at another one of these events shortly. All right. You guys have a good day now.